With lives on the line, a constant ticking clock, and barrels and barrels of red tape to wade through, the life of an organ transplant surgeon is often measured by millimeters while flying at near light speed. This week, my guest and I explore this complicated and often morally gray world together on this week's episode of Beyond the Manuscript. But before we get to that good stuff, I need to introduce my guest for the week. Joining me today on the podcast is the former director of the Heart and Lung Transplant Program at Stanford University Medical Center. He is currently the principal of the Wild Consulting Group, here today to talk about his upcoming novel, All That Really Matters, coming out on June 11th and available for pre-order today. Please help me in welcoming my guest today, Dr. David Weil. How are we doing today, David? I'm doing great. How are you, Cooper? Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. So one of the things that I really try to do uh, on the podcast is I try to find people who are writing books about a subject that I know almost nothing about. Like, it's always a constant journey of learning for me here. And the like premise of your book is, sounded really, really interesting, and I really wanted it on the show. Uh, so to kind of kick things off here, can you please tell us all about your book, uh, All That Really Matters, and what's it about? Yeah, th thank you for that. I bring the reader into the world of organ transplantation, and I do so through a protagonist, Dr. Joe Bosco, who has powerful attributes and profound flaws, and he has a steep rise in his career and then gets himself into a bit of trouble and tries to find his way out of it. There's a romantic uh, interest in the story as well, and as a lot of people that do this kind of high-intensity work, some of the relationships around him suffer and my protagonist joe bosco is no different very cool and so this actually this isn't even your first foray into writing you already have a uh, was it you already have a memoir uh exhale uh, already out on the shelf at the moment here um but great so that's writing nonfiction, and now you're shifting over to the world of fiction here um how difficult was that leap for you? It, it, it was difficult as it is for any novelist to make sure that the characters are developed, that they're not flat on the page, as it were, and three-dimensional. But I explore a lot of the themes that I also talked about in my memoir, but I got more in depth with them actually in the novel and was able to explore them even more deeply. I think medicine needs fiction because I think some of the issues are, are, are so complicated and so profound that it, it lends itself well to storytelling. Sure. So in that kind of same regards there of medicine and fiction, um, as someone who actually has practiced high levels of medicine before, does things like, you know, Grey's Anatomy or House, do, do you laugh at them? Or are you like, wow, they really messed that up on, on their end? Or they just have like no clue and they're doing more of this? Like, how do you feel about like medical dramas on TV? They, they, get, they get some things right and some things not right. Um, things move <laughs> a, lot, a lot more quickly on the TV shows than they do in real life. Um, also, I'll note that the people are better looking. <laughs> uh, on the TV shows than they are in the hospital, um, mm -hmm. present company included. And um, I, I, I think that they really have done a pretty good job of getting, you know, the basics down. But what I wanted to do is somebody who walked in, you know, inside the shoes of a leader of a transplant program, I wanted to give the reader an idea of what that really felt like. And I hope I accomplished that. Sure, sure. And so in that same kind of regard, how similar are you to your main character of Joe? We uh, both grew up uh, or spent some time in New Orleans. We uh, both had a physician father. Uh, the similarities pretty much stopped there, except both of us were involved in transplantation. I like to think that I'm a better guy than Joe is, but uh, <laughs> that, that's for my former work colleagues to judge, not me. <laughs> With the goal of, like you said, kind of pe having your audience kind of peek behind the curtain of this, uh, you know, very spe specialized form of medicine here, um, can you tell us a little bit about the process of actually creating a character like Joe? And how did you try to balance, you know, all right, I need to keep this engaging to my audience and also I need to make sure it's honest and, and true to the real world I'm trying to portray here? I didn't have to look very far. Uh, over a 25-year career, 
I was able to see a lot of characters, some brilliant, uh, some flawed, uh, some arrogant, some incredible human beings. So the, all the characters in my book are really amalgamations of people that I had worked with in the past, people on our transplant teams at various hospitals. So I, I didn't really have to make up characters out of thin air as some novelists had to do, but instead I had to take pieces of a lot of different people that I met along the way and put them into one or more characters. And so um, in your opinion, how does something like uh, fiction or specifically a novel, like the one that you wrote here, um, how do they help people tell like truth to very complicated issues such as like, you know, relationships, healthcare, um, and just, you know, outsized expectations? I, I think having written nonfiction in the past and having written a memoir, you know, you don't want to sit down and actually try to offend somebody or try to call somebody out or have it be a takedown of any institution. But I think in fiction, on the other hand, you, you're less encumbered by actually having to stick to the facts and having to make sure that you're not really hurting somebody with your writing. Uh, these characters mm -hmm. are made up. Uh, they're, they're not based on anybody in real life. And so therefore, I didn't really have to walk around as I was writing the book, worried that I was actually offending somebody. And I think it gave me more liberty also to delve into the systemic issues in healthcare uh, w without having to do a 15 point policy plan about how to fix them. And I think that, that that was liberating in a lot of ways. And so it, I, I'd hate to kind of do this kind of thing, which is like to compartmentalize something so complicated as, you know, the American healthcare system. Um, but in kind of your opinion, what are some big issues that you think need addressing, whether whether they're systemic, individuals, or anything, anything like that? What, what are some things that you hopefully even address in this book uh, at a point? But in your opinion, what, what do you think could use a really good fix? I, th I, I think the big problem, this is from 30,000 feet, is that we've clearly in American medicine at least put profits over purpose in mm. medicine. Mm. So if you look at the stakeholders in American medicine, and I'll, I'll confine my comments right now to American medicine, mm -hmm. you've got the people that provide the care, they're very unhappy right now. The American medical workforce, whether it's doctors, nurses, or other parts of the of the ecosystem, are is disillusioned as I've ever seen them in my career. Mm -hmm. The patients aren't happy with the system. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the folks that are making money off of the system seem to be the only ones that that are happy with how it is right now. Yeah. And I think that we've left out the two key components. First, the patient. Patient has to be satisfied that they're working that the system's working to help them and mm -hmm. to have their interest in mind. And I think anybody that works in medicine knows that that's not always the case. And then the second is we've got to keep this workforce together. I, I can't tell you how many emails and messages I got, particularly after my first book came out that, you know, indicated to me that the nurses and doctors out there were looking to leave the field and they are mm -hmm. leaving the field in numbers that have never been seen before. And I mean, I'm very concerned about that, extremely mm -hmm. concerned. So you see, you, in your kind of opinion, we're kind of heading towards a cliff where, yeah. you know, there are going to be more, like, way too many patients for our system to actually handle. I, I think that's already the case, Cooper. Mm. I, I really, I really do. I, I think we're, we're seeing that now and the system's, you know, not producing the number of nurses or physicians necessary mm -hmm. to take care of an aging population. I think we're already there. Gotcha. Um, so I kind of, want, I do want to get back to the books. I don't want to just talk about the American medical system the whole time, but, um, what do one last thing and a question about it though. Um, in your opinion, what would you say is a misconception of someone who is an organ transplant surgeon like yourself? Like, you know, it, what is something that people might assume one thing, but in reality is very, very different. I think one thing that I've found, and, and this was true um, when I was on the front lines of medicine and now in my current role as a consultant to transplant programs, I think patients think that we're just doing a job, that we don't actually care about their mm. outcomes, that it doesn't matter to us what really happens to them. And I can tell you that the people that do this kind of work, 
nearly universally really care about mm -hmm. the patients that they're treating. We're not robots, we're human beings. And not only do we care about the outcomes of the patients, and I think that that's really universally true, but we also take it um, very personally and feel very responsible when patient outcomes aren't what they should be. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want patients to think, and they shouldn't think, that if a patient doesn't do well after a transplant, we just go home and we continue with our lives. That's really not the case. Mm -hmm. All right, so I do want to get back to the book here. And so um, your character, Joe, um, has, is quite an arrogant character. I don't think it's stretching the, the, you know, the, the word too much by describing Joe as this character. With such a high profile and probably you know, high stress job of being an organ transplant surgeon, do you think uh, the word like arrogance is required for that position? I, I think a strong sense of self is um, it can mm. border on arrogance. Uh, you know, no one wants a shrinking violet as their transplant sur surgeon or somebody yeah. who's not confident or <laughs> is unsure. I, I always found my patients were very responded very well when I was certain or as sure as I could be and mm -hmm. reassuring as I could be. I do think though, there's a fine line. Um, Joe crosses that line uh, from being sure and being confident to being painful as a human being. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a fine line. We, we, are, we are told during the course of our careers by patients and others how wonderful we are. We all become gratitude junkies to one extent or another. And I think if, you're, if you take all of that to heart, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you might, you might develop a God complex. And I do think that <laughs> happens to, I think that happens to some in our field, um, you know, and we all have to guard against it, you know, that do this kind of work mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you're replacing people's organs. And so it's a pretty big job. Sure. Uh, in your experience, um, did it take a while to gain the, that level of confidence of just being, just, knowing that you can do your job correctly or uh you know were you just kind of born with that of like you know what i know i can do this let me research this and actually you know learn my profession as as best as i could or did it take time it it, it took time you know it's an iterative process you gain more and more confidence as time goes on but i can tell you and i think any uh transplant doctor would tell you this at the beginning you're terrified I mean, mm. you're, you're just absolutely terrified because you, you understand the responsibility and you have a bit of an imposter syndrome. You're just not sure if you're up to it yet or not. And I remember the years that that was the case with me and it took probably around a decade or so, you know, training period. And then the post training period, it took about probably 10 years for me to feel like I pretty much have this. I mean, not to say that everything I did was absolutely right all the time, but I pretty much had it after about a decade. But mm. the learning curve, uh, take, it, it's, it takes a little while. Takes I'm a little sure, while. yeah. Yeah, because, you know, you got your, your pre-med college and then grad school and then what, what does it go? It goes residency after that? Am I, am I right? Yeah, yeah. It's four years of college, four years of med school. That's and what it is, yeah. The residency period varies anywhere from six to eight years for what we do. So mm -hmm. I can't do the math. What is that? 14 years total, I yeah. guess. Something like that. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad there are still people out in the world like you who are so dedicated to a profession uh, that keeps people alive. I think that's, that's a really good uh, Pretty big calling there. Um, and speaking of callings, um, a big conflict that's in your book is between Joe, the main character, and his like opportunities to grow his career, and uh, his fiance. And he has he's getting kind of pulled in these two directions here. Um, in your opinion, is one greater than the other, or like does it have to be one greater than the other? Can it be both? Or you know, it, What's your opinion on something like that? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to actually put these two characters together because Joe looked at his career as the most important thing in his life, and it was the most important career in anyone's life, according mm -hmm. to Joe. I wanted to put him next to and have a relationship with a woman who was equally accomplished in her field, but it was not the very testosterone, adrenaline-driven field of transplantation. Hers was more in public health and research, mm. 
more of the mind than of the action. And she thought her career was equally important to Joe's. There's times when Joe didn't think that, and that of course led to conflict. But this is actually happening in in real life in American medicine all of the time. You mm -hmm. know, women in American medicine, their career still in 2024 is not deemed often as important as as the career mm. of the, their ma their male counterparts. Um, yeah. if you or a lot of times, you know, sorry to me to catch up, but a lot of times it's going back yeah. to that, what, I, what I've seen just from family members that I have who work in the medical field, um, yeah. well, one, I have uh, like a lot of female cousins who are doctors, but they still get mistaken for nurses. Uh, and then also right. a lot of times just through within the system, they get pushed towards OBGYN as opposed to something like, you know, brain surgery or something like that. Um, and right. so I, I think you're right. I think there's there's still a few, you know, the there's still pushback on having like high level female doctors a lot of times. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, I, I, I wish I could say that, you know, we're rapidly improving that but in medicine, but we're really not. I, I still think that there's pretty important inequities between uh, male and female physicians. And then if you add in female physicians of color, mm -hmm. then, then the disparities become very stark. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so again, we keep getting sidetracked by, you know, your wealth of knowledge on this subject, but I do want to talk about your book some more still. Um, so one of the characters in your book is Joe's father and who is a Holocaust survivor. Um, how important was having a character like Joe's dad be in this book? It, it was important to me for a number of reasons. One, the book in a lot of ways was about expectations, what expectations mm. other people put on us, what expectations we put on ourselves. Joe's father, a Holocaust survivor, had very, very high expectations of his only son and his only child, Joe. And I think there's also something that's interesting to me, at least, about the children of Holocaust survivors. There's a whole mm. body of research about something called inherited trauma or second generation yeah. trauma. And I think that in Joe's instance, he actually inherited the perfectionism, the always striving to accomplish uh, trauma really from his father's experience as a holocaust survivor and i mm -hmm. and i wanted i wanted to try to show that in the relationship between joe and peter bosco his dad about the tension that can develop in the children of holocaust survivors mm -hmm. it's really interesting you you mentioned that because it really puts me in mind of if you know the writer and comic book artist art spiegel he's the guy who did yeah. mouse yeah and in parts of that book where he's, he's telling the story of his dad surviving uh, the Holocaust and um, like him growing up in adulthood with a father who survived it. And he's talking and he's like in therapy in the comic book, right? Of uh, he's just like, yeah, like, you know, I've never been able to like emotionally connect with my dad, even though, and like, and I know he had, um, you know, one of the worst laws in life, and but he's still his dad, and he still loves him, and he still tries to take care of him as much as possible, but he's still trying to process his own dad's uh, stories that he would tell Art, like little Art Spiegelman as a kid. And so it's really interesting how correct you are on how something massive like that can has just have echoes throughout generations, I think. I think that I think that's right. And the, and the body of research around this area is fascinating. I have a lot of books on my bookshelf about it right now. So I, we're coming up on wrapping up on uh, last little bit of time here. But before we go, I do want to I, I love asking this of all the doctors who I meet is what is a cool medical fact that most people may not know? Uh, I'll give you an example. My favorite medical fact, and please tell me if I'm wrong about this, but a lot of times when somebody's doing surgery uh, on like internal organs, uh, they tend not to put them back exactly how they found it, where like once they close up a person, the organs will kind of over time shift back into where they need to be. Is that true? Yeah, that, that, that is true. I, I, when you were asking me that question, I was, I was wondering if I should use the hiccup example. And the hiccup <laughs> is just a, a spasm of the diaphragm, which sits right below the lungs. Um, but I'll tell you that, you know, I, I've been around long enough where I, I've really seen two incredible developments in medicine. And one is 
the development of the HIV drugs, which have mm -hmm. changed the face of AIDS. I mean, when I was in medical school, AIDS was, you know, just coming around and it looked like a sure death sentence. That's been an amazing development. Yeah. Uh, turn, turning that into a serious but chronic disease often, um, which I, I would have never predicted. The second one is the COVID vaccine, <laughs> uh, the, rapi the rapidity, at you know, with which that vaccine was developed was astonishing to me. Yeah. And um, I, I think those are at least two important developments that I've seen. Those are really cool. And I one thing that um, again, you, you please tell me if I'm wrong because I'm just I'm just a civilian in this medical world here. Um, but is it true that people are starting to tr test out the same technology, the the, the mRNA uh, like vaccine stuff, to develop things like uh, cancer vaccines and stuff like that? Is that true? Or, that, or that, that that's that's absolutely true. In, in, okay. in, fla in fact, the mRNA platform was developed initially for cancer drugs, uh, mm. not so much for vac vaccines and. Uh, uh, the company Moderna and others have, you know, tried to uh, tried to adopt it and use it for vaccines successfully, thankfully. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> that, see, we're, you know, I think, you know, yes, there are a lot of issues that need addressing, but we still live in a really fascinating time, I think, uh, in the world. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I think that is going to do it for us today here on Beyond the Manuscript, which, of course, is powered by Manuscripts, where you never write alone. I want to thank my guest, David Weil, for coming on to the show. Please go pick up his book, All That Really Matters, available right now for pre-order and is debuting on June 11th. David, thank you so much for being on the show. Cooper, thanks for having me. I enjoyed the conversation.